I'm, I'm Kevin Lee, uh, and here I'm representing the, the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research, as again, one of the supporters of this, and um, also the, uh, the Ellison Medical Foundation, which has been supporting aging research for the last 15 years. And what, so thanks to Cruston and, and to Arnie for the uh, opportunity to, to be here at this meeting. What, I, what I'm going to do is, is just generally summarize a little bit about where the field is, why we and these different organizations have been supporting aging-related research. And th this is things that we've been talking about already. Um, and it's going to be more about questions that are being raised rather than answers. And a little bit, I mean, one little snippet of uh, research that's been supported by the, these foundations um, that I think is, is very relevant and interesting. And as it turns out, I'm also uh, going to be talking about adult stem cells. So we're, we're sort of hitting some of the same kinds of topics that were already well introduced. So the, the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research was uh, established in 1965, so 50 years ago, <laughs> by uh, Paul Glenn, who at that time was in his 30s, who realized long before anybody else um, that insights that could be relevant to uh, uh, preventing age-related diseases could be obtained by understanding uh, by doing research on the basic mechanisms of biological aging. And it's been that focus for, for that period of time. So it's really rather remarkable. Um, and and the, the question then that I want to talk about is why support research on aging? What, 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 did, what, did, uh, what was the intention? What, what is the intention now? It's not to solve this problem. Um, the, the, we're not going to do something about the world death rate. The world death rate is remaining steady at 100% responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide. Um, this, this condition is, is not what the objective is. It's not, it's not immortality. And, and all too often, this is what gets played up in the media as the intention of the research that we're doing on aging is really to somehow cheat death. And um, you know, realistically, this, that's not what Calico is about. Um, but but it, it what, it's what gets pulled up, up uh, and um, talked about more, more often than it should be. Instead, what this is really about is, is about age-related diseases. And, and although I do understand the difference between aging and diseases. But, but, but nonetheless, the, the, the greatest risk factor for virtually 95% of all chronic diseases is, is aging itself. So understanding what that fundamental mechanism is, what is, the, what is it about aging that contributes to the pathogenesis of these different diseases is an important piece of knowledge that will be useful in, in developing treatments for these diseases. Just the same as it was important to learn that malaria arises by the infection by a mosquito bite of a malaria parasite. And, and with that knowledge, one can then develop preventive therapies. In, in the same way, we hope that understanding the knowledge of, of, of how biology of aging contributes to disease is, is going to be very meaningful. So the, the intention is, is to do something with this biomarker. Um, uh, a risk factor for disease and to be able to actually manipulate that. Now, if there is, in fact, um, a, uh, a underlying mechanism that's common to, to diseases, this would have a very um, significant impact. And, and the other main reason is because of this, that aging is associated with um, a host of competing chronic diseases. So typically with aging after uh, age of 50, 80% of people have at least one chronic disease. By 65, 75% um, have two or more chronic diseases, et cetera, et cetera. 7% have five or more chronic diseases. And, this, and the issue is that um, uh, attacking this one disease at a time essentially extends the period of time of disability. You survive one uh, disease so that you develop another disease and, and, and live on um, in, in a state uh, that's not unlike um, Tithonus, so in Greek mythology, the mortal uh, lover of Eos, the goddess of the dawn. So Eos begged Zeus for, uh, to grant immortality to Tithonus, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth at the same time. So Tithonus um, went on aging um, and becoming decrepit and uh, declining until he eventually ended up being a, a, a cicada. So the, 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 uh, the consequence, what we're interested in is, is not uh, extended life per se, it's extended health. Uh, so if there are underlying common mechanisms, slowing uh, aging could have benefits 
with, uh, in, in terms of later or fewer deaths from a host of different diseases, and more important, the, the amelioration of suffering from, um, from a variety of chronic diseases. So that, that's, that's ultimately the intention um, of, of this research. Now, what is aging? I mean, aging is something that we can all recognize. We're, we're all very good, actually, at, at uh, identifying a person's age immediately by, uh, by just visual inspection. And yet the, mysteri the process remains very mysterious and enigmatic. Um, there, now, the, the other thing is that there, there is, in fact, uh, we, we use the term aging somewhat loosely, right? Um, there are a number of different phenomena that are going on. So uh, on one hand, aging is a process of development and maturation, a trajectory across the lifespan, you know, the acquisition of, of knowledge and wisdom and life experiences, and, and that is, um, uh, by and large, a good thing. Um, but there's also the, the decline, the increasing uh, decrepitude, the, the lowered resilience, um, uh, senescence, um, and that can be looked at in lots of different ways. So one, you know, performance in athletic events, for example. In this case, it's, all, it, it's females that are being measured here across, and some of the people in this room might be uh, points in the, on this graph. But beginning at around age 35, so there, there's, a, there's a period of performance and improvement up to uh, age 20, then there's a plateau, and then around age 35, performance begins to, um, to decline. And the same is also true in, in, for most domains, not all domains, uh, of cognitive uh, abilities um, with a slightly different time for us and beginning in a slightly different time and so on, varying upon the, the different um, uh, domains. But again, it's something that one can measure, this, this uh, decreased performance, increased, um, uh, uh, or, or decreased ability to respond to challenge um, is, are, are the hallmarks of aging. So understanding what the, those basic mechanisms are is really the goal of this. And what's, um, uh, what, 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 what might seem obvious is that, well, this is, this is you know, physics. This is the second law. Right, so that, that biological systems are by nature imperfect, and that er, imperfections accumulate with, uh, with time. And this, these uh, accumulated junk and damages, uh, damage is what uh, leads to uh, this declining performance. But, uh, but obviously, there, there's, there's more to it than this, and this is the, one of the things that we've uh, been discussing all day, of course, is that different species show these decline rates in, at vastly different time scales, although the laws of physics apply to dogs the same as they do to humans, that we, uh, we, uh, we show many of the same uh, types of disabilities with, with aging in, in some similar ways, osteoporosis, um, um, uh, muscle weakness, cancers, and so on. Um, humans are going through a period of robust growth at the time that other species are uh, succumbing to age-related diseases in their tissues. Um, and some of this, of course, correlates with, with uh, size of the animal and, and so on. But even among animals that are roughly the same size, there could be vastly different uh, uh, rates of, of senescence, uh, rates of aging. And the, the, the modern evolutionary framework that accounts for this is that there is declining nat uh, a force of natural selection um, with age and that uh, um, um, the, the animals that uh, live in environments where there's a great risk of predation and so on have no uh, um, uh, luxury to afford the, the costly repair mechanisms that, that keep the soma functioning uh, longer. Um, and there are, there are uh, other variations on this that are, that are important as well, the idea that there are pleiotropic um, 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 mutations that where, where nature is selecting for um, uh, advantages to, to young animals, and if those same advantages are deleterious later in life, then that, th those also tend to accumulate. So that's the, that's the framework that has uh, arisen in, in terms of understanding what's going on, and what's, what's clear is that there are a whole variety of what, what, are, what we're going to call hallmarks of aging. So phenomena that occur during the process of aging, first of all, that are manifest during aging, and uh, which, if one exacerbates them or uh, increases them, you see a greater um, a rate of accumulation of um, um, the phenotypes of aging. 
And at the same time, if one um, decreases these hallmarks of aging, you um, slow down the process of senescence. So things like genomic, genome instability, telomere attrition, um, proteostasis, these are things that are um, occurring with age, and there are biological processes that counteract these effects. And they're all, um, and they're in, in fact interrelated in very, very important ways. So what's important is to try to understand how these um, different hallmarks of aging relate to one another and how and when one might think to, be, to apply that knowledge to, um, to um, uh, affect senescence. So there are, in fact, primary um, uh, 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 causes of damage that then, um, so for example, um, uh, genome instability or tel telomere attrition leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, which can then also uh, increase um, um, or um, the, the uh, genome instability or uh, cause senescence, which can affect uh, the, the uh, intracellular communications, for example, the secretion of these uh, SASP profiles that are pro-inflammatory and, and, and damage tissues. So this framework is really what, um, what the, the, the intention of this research is to, is to build out. And I think the important point is that, that aging is what's uh, um, a cause or a consequence of the physical properties, but there are biological mechanisms that, that uh, exist to counteract those properties. And understanding how these biological uh, mechanisms work and how one might be able to enhance them is really the goal. So one, one example that I thought I would talk about is in terms of, again, um, uh, the aging of tissue-specific uh, stem cells. So as, as we've discussed before, in, in many tissues of the body, there are populations of, of adult-specific stem cells that have regenerative capacity um, in the hematopoietics uh, uh, system, in mesenchymal tissues, in muscle intestines, in the cent central nervous system. There are populations of cells which, with age, either lose a regenerative potential, they have uh, changes in their ability to form different cell types, for example. In some cases, they lose proliferative capacity or, or their numbers decline. And there's good evidence that, that this decline in these stem cell populations is an important driver of aging. So in those um, aging tissues, though, uh, these stem cells must have accumulating damage with times. Are there mechanisms to keep these stem cells pristine to, um, to uh, maintain their function? Obviously, for some uh, animals, uh, these stem cell compartments are, are, are protected for long periods of time. In a, in a mouse, the, some of the, the, these declines occur in the, in the matter of uh, you know, a year. So what I want to talk about is work that was done recently um, um, uh, in David Sabatini, with David Sabatini and, and uh, Bob Weinberg at the Whitehead Institute and uh, Pekka Katehisto, who's now at the University of Helsinki. Uh, so what they simply did was to ask, okay, are, are these damaged components, organelles in cells, in these stem cells, um, uh, protected in some way during the aging of the organism? And they did this with a sort of an elegant series of pulse chase experiments where they used a photoactivatable form of green fluorescent protein where a pulse of light would, be, uh, uh, would allow them to label a green fluorescent protein. And this was attached to a tag that would traffic the green fluorescent protein to different compartments within uh, subcellularly. So, and, and then after a pulse of light, they, they age the cells and follow the, the fluorescent protein that's labeled mitochondria or nuclei or lysosomes and so on, membranes, uh, as these cells grow. And they're looking at uh, mammary epithelial uh, stem cells, stem-like cells in culture, which are, have a round morphology in these cultures. And they divide asymmetrically, so to produce, uh, to self-renew, generate another um, uh, stem cell and uh, also generate a, a progenitor cell, a transient amplifying cell that gives rise to epithelial uh, uh, differentiated cells that are commi is committed to a def differentiation state. So when they looked specifically at all of that chasing this fluorescent label in different subcellular compartments in different, um, uh, as the cells divide, after 10 hours, they were able to see, after a 10-hour labeling period and, and, a, and a chase, the fluorescent uh, the protein that's tagged specifically to mitochondria 
shows an asymmetric distribution between uh, daughter cells that arise from specifically the round morphology um, uh, stem cells in their cultures. And so um, that's, if you look here, after a, after a division, um, they're looking at two different cells in, in morphologically round, so these are the stem cell-like cells. Um, that one will be called P1 and one will be called P2. And the P2 cell specifically excludes the old labeled mitochondria. And so those, those are the cells, those are mitochondria that have been generated at least 10, uh, 10 hours before the, the cell division. Whereas all other um, uh, com compartments within the cell that they followed were, showed a completely symmetrical distribution. So that means that, that the, the uh, cells are able to specifically restrict only the newly generated mitochondria to the cells that, um, to one set of the cells that arise from this asymmetric uh, division of, a, um, of, a, of a, um, a stem cell in this culture. And the important, and the important thing is that these, uh, so this is another way of looking at this. So only in the round uh, stem cell-like divisions do you see this, this segregation. And uh, it's possible by facts, by fluorescence-activated cell sorting, to separate out the, the populations of cells that either generate, um, that either inherit a, a large amounts of the uh, old mitochondria, so they're more uh, labeled, versus those cells that uh, in, uh, it preferentially inherit less of the, the old labeled mitochondria. And then in a, in a cell culture assay, they measure their ability, their stemness, their ability to form mammospheres, which is a measure of their ability to self-renew and to be pluripotent. And so forming these uh, is, is a property that's preferentially in those that have inherited the young mitochondria. So in other words, inheriting these, this, these young mitochondria selectively is a way for uh, cells to maintain the stem cell quality and effectively remain young uh, or be rejuvenated during this process. And, and interestingly, if you uh, block uh, processes of mitochondria quality control and trafficking <laughs> by blocking um, the uh, activities that, that uh, uh, affect mitochondrial sorting and fission, these quality control mechanisms, you eliminate the ability, so you block the ability of these cells to be stem cells. So in other words, it's a prerequisite to sort these mitochondria the young mitochondria to remain a stem cell. Cells that inherit only the old mitochondria lose their stem cell capabilities. Again, a, another way to sort of preserve tissues and to fight back against the, you know, the damage that's accumulating with each renewal um, um, preserving these cells in, in a young state. So effectively, you know, I like the idea of rebranding the, the science that we're studying here, not so much the, the, the biology of aging, but the biology of, of remaining youthful. Uh, I think it's not only uh, helpful in terms of uh, public relations, but also helpful in terms of thinking about what it is that these processes are doing. In fact, you know, maintaining uh, vitality uh, throughout the life of an organism. So I will finish with that and, um, and take any questions. Yes. Published a few years ago, a paper in the Journal of Gerontology, How Fast Do We Age? Right. I used your marathon stuff, also rowing and biking and swimming. Right. And all of them deteriorate for a 40 year period, midlife, at the rate of a half a percent per year, which is exactly the same decline rate as VO2 max. Right. And fit people. Unfit people go down at 2% per year. So the difference between fit and unfit is only a percent and a half per year. So you don't see it short term. But multiply that out to age 70, then you've got the big difference. Right, right. It's a, it's a very useful biomarker um, of aging, right, of course. Well, I'd just like to make a comment about your final sl beautiful slide up there yeah. <laughs> depicting the bristlecone pines yeah. because the statement underneath it is in error. Right, right. It says the oldest living things in the world. They certainly are not because if the, the, the only living part in those trees is the cambium layer. And uh, that is no more than 35 years old. So that all of us in this room are older than this alleged 
bristlecone pine. What the pine has learned to do, along with redwood trees and many other trees, is how to hang on to its cells that we would ordinarily slough. And they do that for architectural purposes right. because they need to rise up as high as they can in order to meet sunlight. Right, and, and likewise, we're composed of cells of very different ages, right? So, so our adult stem cells, which may be actually much younger, because they preferentially inherited mitochondria that have only been recently generated, may be not unlike this, right? So there may be components within us that are, that are young, but the, the, the husk on the outside is, is, uh, is aging. Kevin, is there a mechanistic concept behind the segregation, asymmetric it's, segregation of mitochondria given rise remain, to? So it's, it's not membrane potential. It, that alone is not sufficient to um, determine the segregation of old into young mitochondria. So what the, what the label is that no, labels I, these. I, the geography of it, that doesn't bother me. I could understand how you could tag an old and a, not a young and so forth and drag it in with membranes and stuff. I meant that the young is pluripotent than the old is a retiring mother, right? Right. And um, that suggests that the distribution of mitochondria is making a determination about pluripotency. It, it's exactly, right? exactly. Right. And Which is, that's I what I was that, asking that's for the, a mechanism that's, of. That's, yes. that's the very interesting part, right? right. So, so that, that prevents the cells who have uh, old, uh, you know, inherited the old, that's a quality control um, step. Um, so that there must be a feedback saying, um, you know, you really should take yourself out of circulation. Um, and, and the mechanism of that, I think, is it remains un completely unknown. Maybe one is weak and the other one's strong <laughs> in the sense that... Uh... Well, so, so it certainly involves, you know, as we've discussed, you know, this asymmetric cell division and the polarized signal that... Uh, results in this division is a big, you know, so the geometry of that cell division is an important component of this. So it might be that, we're, you know, you're sort of affecting the cell is losing that geometrical segregation in the same process, and that in and of itself is, is sufficient. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right, 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 exactly, right. I mean, not the only thing that the asymmetric divide. Right, right. Maybe a consequence of something else. Right, right, but it, it right. But from, in terms of aging, one would think that this is an important component of that, right? So metabolic health, um, mitochondrial health, right? Can you somehow disrupt that process? Or what the consequences well, so, so I mean, it, it's been disrupted there by blocking Parkin activity or using a drug that, um, that blocks the, this dynamin-related protein. So, so there you're preventing the mitochondrial um, trafficking and fission, right? So, um, but, but, and, and then the consequence of this is that cells differentiate. They become committed to differentiate, and they don't retain their, their stem cellness. I think we, since we 